This is a Founding Media podcast. Hello, everyone. On today's episode of Packing Taste, we have Taylor O'Neill, CEO of Richard's Rainwater. Richard's Rainwater is a bottle water company, but they capture rainwater and then fill up the bottles with it. Thank you for coming on the show today, Taylor. Thanks we're, for having me. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're excited. I know it's been a little, a little hard to get you here, but <laughs> you're finally here. And funny enough, it's raining outside today, so... We're well, some of the only people that are happy when it's raining. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, but let's start off with um, telling us who is Richard, because you're Taylor O'Neill, the CEO. So who is who's Richard? Sure. So Richard's a real person. Uh, he was the first person in the United States to get approval for bottling rainwater back in 2002. Um, before that, he lived out in hill country and was not satisfied with his water options, so began exploring a whole home rainwater system. So his entire house ran on rainwater, his dishwasher, his sink, his toilets. Um, And a bunch of his neighbors started coming over, checking out the house, and they all started asking him for the rainwater system. So he started by installing these systems for a bunch of people out in Dripping Springs, Texas. Um, And then the story goes that one day he was out on a job too far away, and uh, it struck him that he should bottle rainwater too because he didn't want to go an entire day without drinking his own rainwater. So that started a four-year process uh, with the regulators in Texas to get approval for for the process, but importantly for a process that had no chlorine involved in the entire sanitation. So he got the first public water supply in the United States that didn't use chlorine um, at the same time that he got his rainwater bottling license. And then spent about 15 years um, doing both businesses, installing the systems, as well as selling the bottles. Um, I tell people he had some of the coolest clients in Austin, many of which we continue to call uh, customers today, um, but cared a lot more about catching rain uh, and drinking it himself than telling people about it and selling the rainwater. Um, So we've invested in the company in late 2017, um, did some work on the packaging, and have significantly ramped the business from a sales and marketing perspective and, and thought um, thought a lot about capacity expansion and how to scale a business that's dependent on rain um, and developed a bunch of really great partners from a distribution perspective. So he's a real person, a real innovator, <laughs> a bit before his time, but uh, I think his thinking on clean water is increasingly relevant in our country as we deal with things uh, like the Austin Water Boil Ordinance yeah. or the smelly yeah. water that we had a couple weeks ago. Yeah. He, was, he was a bit before his time. Yeah, So I, I and I'd love to get there in a bit, but before we get there, I think we should chat a little bit more about how you catch rainwater and how you put it in a bottle. Because when people think of rainwater, they think it's dirty, it's the clouds are gray, why would they drink that? So if, and and I read that you guys call it a cloud to bottle process. Uh, and correct me if I'm wrong. And this, I don't know anything about science other than reverse osmosis. Sure. Right? So if you can tell us a little bit about that, so, just so we know how this water's clean. Sure. So we get the question a lot. Um, Rainwater is actually the most naturally pure source of water on the planet. Um, We do triple filter it as part of the process of getting approval for bottling rainwater and extra backup safety measures just to absolutely ensure that everything is uh, pristine. But honestly, we've tested the source water before and after the purification for 15 years, and you'd be astonished at how clean the water is. this, the concept is really simple. We catch the rain before it starts getting dirty. So water is a natural solvent. It absorbs everything that it touches. And uh, there's certainly some unique places left on Earth where people are, you know, fewer and farther between than in, in most developed parts of the United States where water goes through a process on its way to a source of drinking water that doesn't make it more dirty. Um, But in a lot of cases in today's world, it's going through things like fertilizer and pesticides and, you know, just natural contaminants from the development of humanity. Um, So our 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 concept, again, is simple. It's it's about catching the rain before those things start being absorbed. Um, 
and then we triple filter it. So it goes through a micron filter, then it hits uh, ultraviolet light. We do run it through a reverse osmosis machine. However, the interesting thing about that is we pump what's called the brine. So this the part, the part of the water that gets separated out through that sure. purification back into our starting tank and um, use it again in, in our water process because it's so naturally clean. There's actually nothing in it that's dirty. You could drink it. Um, if you were to run some city water, obviously every city water, you know, varies in terms of its um, sanitation and cleanliness, but as much as half of the water of some municipalities in this country would be undrinkable if you ran it through the same reverse osmosis machine. Um, and then last, the key in our mind um, to the whole all natural process is we use ozone um, as a natural disinfectant. Uh, that replaces chlorine and most other the the ozone ozone it's just o3 gas okay. it's a very a okay. little thing you insert into the very large tank yeah uh, yeah so um the entire every bottle um that we have the water's never touched the ground and it's never touched a chemical of any kind through the entire process of um, purification. I get the question a lot, what about impurities in the air? What about uh, you know, smog, smog and, and things like, like that? that? So, you know, a couple a couple facts about that. Obviously, first just you know, for our business, we are certainly attempting to catch rain in areas like Dripping Springs, Texas where there's not a ton of, you know, industrial activity. Yeah. The air is is really clean. Um, but it's little known fact uh, I'm finding uh, impurities in the air are actually heavier than um, other parts of the atmosphere. So in a rain event, the rain forms around those more the more heavy component, the pollution in the air, and it falls from the sky first. So we do have a, the only waste in our process is a downspout that we use to clear the first five to 10 minutes of any rain event from even entering our filtration. And that should, in theory, catch all of the impurities in the air all at one time before it even enters our system. So it's um, it's uh, the rain actually acts as a purifying event for the atmosphere. And after that first five to ten minutes of any rain event, even if there were uh, smog or pollution in the air, uh, the water that we collect is absolutely pristine. Yeah. So I imagine I imagine it sounds like you guys do a lot of. Uh, testing for this, making sure um, there's certain levels in the water staying where they need to be. And as you said earlier, you guys are the first uh, water bottle company to have been approved to sell rainwater in the entire U.S. Um, so if you can just tell us how that felt. Uh, I, I don't know if you were in the process when that was going on with Richard, um, but how did that look like? Because I know with getting a, a salsa approved to sell in Texas, you send it to a lab, you'll get approval. If it meets all the requirements, you'll get approval in 30 days and then you'll get you know FDA approved um, and, and you'll be good to go. But this sounded like this was never happening in the US, so it needed to get approved in the legislation phase. Um, so do you know a little bit more about that? How did that look like? Was it easy? Was it hard? What? Yeah, sure. So uh, I wasn't at the company when Richard got approval back in 2002, but I know from talking to Richard that it took him four years to get uh, wow. the state to sign off. So it was certainly not the seamless process that you just talked about for salsa. <laughs> uh, and actually exciting, we just went through the process again. Um, we just got approval to bottle rainwater in the state of Mississippi. Um, so our long-term vision of Richard's Rainwater is to collect rain in lots of different communities all over the country and then to keep the rain as close to where we catch it and to consume the rain as close to where we catch it as is possible. So that it cut down on our carbon footprint. It builds on this concept of local building economies and um, employment and sustaining a local uh, community based on something that everyone in the community needs to survive water. Yeah. Right. So our first pro uh, project outside of Dripping Springs, Texas, was in Kiln, Mississippi, with a brewery called Lazy Magnolia Brewing. Um, 
we installed our system into their brewery and then went through the process. It took about seven months with the state, um, even though we had 15 years of yeah. of uh, testing going back to the date Richard started. And this, this system is the one that was approved by Texas. It's very similar, yeah. Okay. So the goal will be to have the same purification, the same process at every facility where we're catching rainwater. And so the quality and the uh, consistency of the product will follow the process that we undertake to catch it, purify it, bottle it, carbonate it. Um, and we think this is a really exciting opportunity. Uh, there's, you know, the craft beer world has undertaken a boom, which has been, oh, yeah. been great for my time at the bar. Um, <laughs> that th Those businesses are in our mind increasingly looking for additional products to to fill downtime on their machines and to make their business not more sustainable in the in the sense of sustaining the environment but more sustainable from a business reality so uh, most breweries have equipment that we can use uh, cuts down on our capital expense makes us an ideal partner for for those for those businesses and uh, the folks over at lazy magnolia have been have been thrilled about this cutting edge Mississippi reality. Um, you know, they're they're gonna be on the, the leading uh, the leading lines of rainwater and clean water uh, concepts in our mind. You know, it sounds simple when you talk about just bottling it, but if you thought about um, corporate buildings and commercial buildings becoming run on rainwater or instead of, you know, thinking about how to prevent flooding um, by running rainwater into less dangerous places, which is absolutely something that is important in, in places like Houston and Mississippi and yeah, New Orleans. Exactly. But what if we could take over time that water and instead of just making it less dangerous, turned it into a resource? Mm -hmm. When you think about um, you know places like Flint, Michigan, um, when you think about California and Las Vegas and some of the concerns that we're having about people running out of rainwater or running out of water to drink, running out of water to run their farm. Um, you know, it's certainly a more futuristic view, but what if we could transport that water more efficiently from places where we get an abundance of it to the point where it's dangerous to places where today it's dangerous because we don't have enough? Yeah. So it, it sounds like not only is this rainwater pretty sustainable? But if set up correctly, you can also prevent issues or, or alleviate issues like, like you're saying, flooding or, or the issues in Flint, Michigan. Um, yes, sir. Don't get me wrong. We're as a tiny small business in Austin, Texas. We're not. We're certainly not claiming we can solve the flooding issue in New Orleans or of Mississippi. Of course, of course. And we definitely, um, you know, we do go out of our way to be charitable in mm. terms of. Uh, in our mind, sort of two big groups, the, the communities where we live and work and mm -hmm. sell our rainwater, catch our rainwater. We try to be active participants um, in all kinds of philanthropy in those in those communities. And we also think about the global human community of which 660 million people live without immediate access to clean water and waterborne illness is one of the largest causes of death on the yeah. planet. Um, we are aware that by being in the business of clean water, we're part of those problems and those realities, and we're we're trying to be as cognizant of that as we can as we build our business practices. Um, and so, I would say flooding, you know, flooding and Flint fall in the category of things we're aspiring to be yeah, to yeah. be part of so solving. Uh, we're going to have to sell a bunch more water and build a bunch more resources before um, you know we're a material component of, of those course, issues. Of but course. we're but the point is. We're thinking about them, yeah, and it's yeah. part of the it's reason. Dream big. Why, yeah, it's yeah. part of the reason why we got involved in Richards and why trying to figure out how to scale a business that was dependent upon the weather, in a place like Texas, uh, where in Dripping Springs we we have droughts. Uh, so yeah. it was not a simple thing to decide to get involved in, and it was not a it was not a super obvious. Um, pathway to scale and capacity expansion. So we're really excited about the Mississippi development and our partners there. And we're already looking at projects in Houston, Atlanta, um, San Antonio, North Carolina. Um, we're, we're excited about the pipeline of additional expansion projects, potentially even um, projects you know in the Northeast or the Midwest that might rely on snow yeah. sometime in the future too. So, so kind of to ask you a little bit more about the manufacturing side of 
this. It sounds like you guys have a good lockdown on how to catch this water, how to clean it up, and how to bottle it. But what would be other like difficulties or hurdles you guys have experienced with with Richard's rainwater? Is it um, teaching teaching the public that this stuff is sustainable and good to drink, or is it getting approval in different states? What would be one of the more more difficult tasks that you as CEO have to uh, uh, deal with? Sure. So I think, um, you know, certainly we're like any small company building our brand, telling our story, um, just general awareness of who we are, what we're about, why it's important and how good the water is, is a challenge. Uh, um, But beyond that, unique to Richard's Rainwater, um, you know, in most CPG, consumer packaged goods businesses, your your best business reality from a manufacturing standpoint is consolidating manufacturing in as few locations as is possible and driving efficiencies through economies of scale. And in a lot of cases, they leverage traditional co-packers to do just that. Um, in our case, you could call Lazy Magnolia a co-packer, but it's really more than that. We're going to tap into their customer base. We're going to tap into their distribution. We have a Um, much more aligned interest than a typical co-packer relationship. Um, And I envision that being the relationship that we try to develop with every partner that we install our, where we install our system and become um, business partners more than co-packer customer relationship. Um, It's important to us because it's going to be the ability to have lots of different places um, feel and be treated like local business partners, mm-hmm. um, which we think increasingly in in our country, people care about that. Everywhere we go, you know, Texas is big on Texas, um, so it's it's uniquely strong here. But I think everywhere, um, folks are very interested in supporting the people that live next door to them. Um, and we think that this model will create, foster that type of community in lots of different places and is a unique attribute of what we're trying to do. However, it also creates the challenges of managing, you know, lots of, you know, node-like manufacturing facilities, mm-hmm. which is counterintuitive to how most um, most consumer goods companies are structured. So that also creates challenges of managing weather and ensuring tanks are full and where they need to be in lots of different places, managing lots of different partners. Mm-hmm. Um, all kinds of different logistical challenges that exist because of the way that we're going to choose to grow our business. Um, I personally think that the challenges are worth it in terms of the um, alignment of interest with our partners and and the local communities where we're going to expand into as we um, have access to more capacity in in these um, partner partner relationships. So it sounds like trying to utilize that Southern hospitality in other states, trying to uh, you keep bringing up the word community, which I love using here. I feel like Texas is very closely knit when it comes to helping um, each other out. We both know Austin is a booming CPG uh, community, and we, we have elites and all stars and leaders all over Texas, kind of helping each other out. Have you felt that uh, within this community? Not just from you know retail clients or, or hotel clients, but like. Um, whenever you have a question or whenever you're thinking of expansion or like going out from Dripping Springs to Austin, do you feel like there's a lot of, lot of connectivity? Sure. I mean, absolutely. Right. And we do our best to be, to be part of that. Um, We do weekly workout activities with a number of other leading uh, Austin brands. Uh, We do, uh, a bunch of work with uh, fo- uh, charities focused in Austin on uh, clean water, principally in Africa, like Well Aware and the Nobility Project and the Gazelle Foundation. Uh, we try to be um, really supportive of the Andy Roddick Foundation and their efforts to, to build community for folks um, after school programs and in the summer. Um, we think it's an important part of being being a component of any community, but we take it extra seriously because we sell water, which is something that our customers need to survive. It's not just, it's not just a great candy bar or, uh, you know, a new, a new shirt or, yeah. or something that can bring people a lot of joy, but 
um, much more a, a want than a need. Um, you know, it's also a unique time in Austin because there's a bunch of uh, local sparkling water companies mm-hmm. that have s- sprouted up. So um, that's exciting. You know, I think in some cases they're they're not even really we're doing different things and solving different needs and um providing different products for for different different times but um that's been fascinating too yeah i I imagine because i know i know especially here in in texas um houston austin san antonio um, dallas we're kind of turning into these fanatics of water bottle companies especially sparkling water and we have um Obviously, big players who have been around forever, uh, with some French names, very, very attractive. But the thing about y'all's water is it comes from the sky. Yeah. It's rainwater. So do you think, well, do you think, I think this is kind of obvious, this kind of gave you a niche within that category of bottling water, right? You, no one else is doing it. Um, so you guys got to take over that space and kind of squeeze into the whole category. Has that been something useful, something proud uh, that you guys carry? Absolutely. So what we see in the water market is number one, bottled water, not sparkling water, is one of the biggest markets in the world mm-hmm. um, in, in terms of bottled beverages. And the sparkling water category is, is much smaller, but growing exceptionally fast as people switch from drinking sugar, carbonated beverages to more healthy alternatives. Um, and then when you think about the water market, as you go into Whole Foods or HEB or Bucky's or wherever you, wherever you're buying your water, um, in for the most part they can be grouped into two pretty large buckets. They're either bottled at the source waters mm-hmm. um, that are typically bottled internationally, which is what Ozark. Oh, sorry, uh, uh, bottled. Uh, so bottled at the source would be. Pellegrino, Perrier, okay. Uh, okay. Aquapana, um, things like that, yeah. right? So they've, Fiji, they've uh, found a very interesting source of water that has been um, unaffected by the development of human human construction yeah. and human industrial development. Um, and they bottle it, and it's great water. And, um, you know, typically the waters we're, we compete with most frequently but in a world where folks are really cognizant of the carbon footprint that they're creating and the that the companies that they're supporting are creating um and it's an increasing focus for for people to bottle water in a single source at a single place which is definitionally what they're doing yeah uh and then sending it all over the world um the carbon footprint from that is is challenging to explain um, as folks start to focus on that more. And then you've got a bunch of other waters that are mostly bottled in the United States that um, typically source their water from the same water sources that come out of your faucet. So we think we have this really interesting intersection of um, a pure source of water that is differentiated but can be transported or at least found in lots of different places without the packaging coming on first. So we think that we can catch the rain in all kinds of different places, bottle it there, and then again, try not to move it very far from where it's caught and bottled to where it's consumed, which will open up all kinds of really interesting things um, on the back end in terms of partnerships where we really focus on recycle or reuse that again would be very challenging if you were you know, going all over the world to find your bottles or all over the country to find your bottles versus um, partnering with folks to find the packaging, catch the rain, bottle the rain, sell the rain all in Austin or all in Houston. Now you know where the bottles are. You can measure and track and figure out how to go about finding them after they've been consumed and try to make sure you're doing your part on the back end to be part of the the closed loop um, sustainable cycle that is difficult if you're telling a sustainable story to be part of a single use packaging business. Um, you know, single use packaging is, you know, generally considered by, by folks to be bad for the environment. So we want to be focused on, um, how do we, how are we best about packaging, um, that we can be, and then how do we contribute on the back end, 
uh, which is where we really think the differentiation is going to come. We think there's a lot of um, miss. I'm not sure what the right word is. There's a lot of um, the packaging reality in our mind is much more holistic than the conversation typically starts and ends. The typical typical conversation we're part of is plastic is bad, which we agree. But, um, you know, we uh, we think that the best packaging from a holistic perspective in terms of where did you get the packaging? How did you transport it? How did you fill it? Once you filled it, how far did it go after yeah. that? You know, there's a there's a much bigger conversation um, about what packaging is best. What is always consistent is that less packaging is better than more, mm -hmm. and that recycling and reuse of that same packaging is better than not. So we're going to focus our energy on, um, you know, those things that are universally true. Yeah. Um, we're looking at some technologies where you could create a dispensing machine so that you could install it in a hotel or a yeah. or a, a airport or something, catch the rain off the roof, dispense it into a multi-use. Uh, you know, water bottle as opposed to a single use. So there's future, again, future, yeah, future aspirations than, of course. than now. And but yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I think that what I like about your company is that it's not, you You don't just differentiate like, oh, we catch rainwater and we put bubbles in it and that's why we're the best. You guys are out there kind of trying to change the way people are drinking water. Um like using a more sustainable approach, uh, working with breweries, for example, and kind of trying to change the way it's it's being done. And I think those are the companies that kind of stand out, especially with the new age consumers of not just, we don't just want a product. We want to know the story. We want to know that we're helping. We want to know that we're part of this whole group, this whole ecosystem. So I think you guys are doing a really good job with that. And I, I know that you guys... Um, you said something about an investment, and I know that you guys rebranded from this. Uh, we, we don't have the older bottles, but it used to be an older bottle with a little darker look, kind of like a, cl a dark cloud in the back. <laughs> um, and then you guys completely switched over to this uh, eye-catching uh, bottle with new branding, uh, packaging. Looks pretty sexy to me. Um, <laughs> eye-catching, no dark clouds anymore. Um so can you tell us a little bit about m more about that and also when you came on as CEO? I don't think we mentioned that, but you came on a couple years ago, but the rebranding was done recently. Yeah, so we we bought um, made an we made an investment in Richard's company. He's he's still a consultant, and uh, he and his wife Susie will be um, important people for us at the company, both by heritage and. Um, economics for many years to come, but we made an investment in the business in October of 2017. At the time we made the investment, I became the CEO. I helped uh, kind of negotiate the deal and um, inherited the responsibility of overseeing um, <laughs> the capacity expansion and the new packaging um, when we made the investment. And uh, I have to give uh, credit where credit is due. The, the package redesign was done by a local company, Helms Workshop, Christian Helms and his his team were fantastic. Um, they've done a lot of good work in town, very well known, um, and they definitely, I think, uh, hit this one out of the park. People definitely, people seem to love it. Um, it's not my area of expertise, <laughs> so I defer, I defer to the feedback. But yeah, we get, we get a lot of really positive comments about both the sparkling water and the still water package, um, and in a land of, or in a world where. Folks are Instagramming their meal of before course. they eat it. Uh, nearly universally, it's it is an important component of building a great consumer packaged goods business. Is having something people feel good about I holding and taking photos with. Yeah. Yeah. So that that happened around 2016. Um, end of 2017. And, October 2017. Okay. We made the investment and we did the package in the next. It was finished sometime in March or April okay. of. of Last year, 2018, and um, yeah, so now, okay, now and then, it's been in the works for a while. Yeah, and we recently, I follow you guys on Instagram, and I saw like an end of the year post saying that you guys got in, I think it was a thousand new doors, and or, or something, something 
Not crazy. quite that many, but we did pretty well for it, it, having a company with only one salesperson yeah. who joined in the middle of last year. We ended the year uh, having added about 450, 450. all on premise accounts. So bars, restaurants, hotels, spas. Um, which, until, which uh, sorry to interrupt, yeah. but I definitely want to ask you about that because that seems. As as I go into the the CPG industry and and grow um, my my brand, it, it's very interesting to me seeing how people utilize the food service side, meaning bars, uh, hotels, restaurants, because that's where people go in and they're going to taste something. They're going to try something versus a a, a, a retail store, or a grocery store. They're not going to try anything there. Yeah, you can demo, you can sample at a store level, but when people are at a restaurant, at a bar, they're definitely going to consume something. So how has that helped you guys, especially in Austin where everyone goes out to eat? Like, who came up with that strategy? How are you guys taking advantage of it? And what are your favorite? Um, are bars cooler than than restaurants or are hotels more effective? What, what do you think about all that? Sure. So it was a deliberate strategy, uh, although I will from a strategic standpoint, it was partly driven by the reality of the capacity of one plant dependent upon rain. Um, so it was it was really for two reasons. The first is exactly what you said. If we go in and we talk to the general manager, or the owner of um, you know Elizabeth Street Cafe, and we convince them that this water's great, we let them try it, and they get on board, then they transport our message to their customers, and they transport our product to their customers, and their customers naturally trust them to be a fantastic food service establishment that's why they're there um so i think it helped us build our brand to do that it was intentional and um also a function of walking into whole foods there's 72 waters seventy thousand <laughs> sparkling water kinds out there right and if you walk into a bar typically we've got one or two so it it was intentional to do that to find those partners that are that had their own established brands convince them that our brand was should be part of that um it was a successful strategy here in austin in particular and and one that we're continuing to um, deploy in other markets in texas and then now as we access lazy magnolias extra capacity increasingly in other markets outside of texas as well um, our commitment on that side of things is to not move the water more than 500 miles that's the goal um, from where it's caught first and over time to try to shrink that to 100 miles or less um, and then as far as the second reason is just the <laughs> reality of uh you know an heb or a whole foods um or Randall's or they just buy so much water that yeah. uh, we needed to make sure that our processes and our equipment and our people and our rain collection were all um, sufficient to fill those orders and not disappoint our customers in any way. Um, so we're really excited about that for kind of a middle 2019. Um, I think you'll start seeing us in a number of the grocery uh, the groceries that you're most familiar with, and yeah. we're we're real excited about that. It's a critical component to building a great brand is to have both on premise and off premise exposure, so that people are seeing you multiple times and and certainly have access to buy you after they uh, decide that they like it. Yeah, de definitely agree. Trying to focus both on the food service side of things to educate the consumer, and then being readily available in the retail yeah. space, Whole Foods, H E B, like you said. Um, so we, we need to wrap up quickly, but I have two more questions um, for you. First, and we'll do one at a time, but mm -hmm. what if you can tell the audience a little bit of, about what inspires you? What, like, why, why CEO of a water company and not being here in Austin? Why not the CEO of a, a tech startup? Mm -hmm. Sure. <laughs> so my background, I, I started my career as an investment banker. And then I did mergers and acquisitions in the corporate setting um, in healthcare companies. And then I joined a hedge fund. Um, so I had the, the soul sucking financial uh, background prior to, to Rainwater. So the, the ability to be part of a company that's thinking about things well beyond just the selling of a product. Um, you know, we are every day talking about how to be better participants in our local communities. We are talking about partnerships with folks that are thinking about people who live without clean water. We're talking about technology that would eliminate 
uh, at least part of the packaging that comes along with our business. Um, and then eventually we're going to be investing in this concept of closed loop and how do you really transformationally change um, an industry that's huge and um, growing quickly, but um, maybe lacks this, this, some of the innovation that, that other industries um, have. So it's exciting. It makes, makes me feel a lot more worthwhile getting up every day, trying to think about those things. Um, and it's been a really great year, um, fostered by meeting a lot of really great people, hiring some really great employees, um, having a lot of really exciting conversations and um, thinking about ways we can make bigger impacts in the future. Beautiful. Um, no, well, definitely well said. And, and lastly, uh, one of my questions I like asking um, founders, owners, CEOs, people who run kind of operations of things, but how do you manage what you want to do, what you should do, and what you have to do on a daily basis? Not well. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I mean, part, part, some, some people ask. I, I, one of the things that it strikes me about running such a small company is part of the initial success is um, a tenacity and, and a willingness to do all of those things um, as often as you can with enough energy and passion that – you get some other folks excited. Um, and we did that, I think, pretty well for the first year. Now it's about setting up business processes and people and practices that are more scalable than the sort of tenacity. Uh, and hopefully keeping that culture of hard work and um, diligent a attention to detail and always thinking about ways we can do stuff better. But, um, you know, I think a lot of it for the first year was just um, – a, a willingness to try really hard not to lose and to try to, to, to transfer what we felt about our product on a kind of one-to-one -one basis to yeah. as many people as we could. And now the job is to take those messages and those people and and the more scalable ways to build a brand, the social media, the, uh, the events, the exposure in the store, pricing and promotion, and all the things that people who've run these kinds of businesses um, successfully for a long time have deployed. Uh, I think we're kind of at that phase now. We're trying to think about um, less about one-on-one -on -one and more about one-to-many. And uh, we know we've got a really good product. We think it's important, the things that we stand for, that um, are those other additional elements of uh, yeah. not just selling a bottled water, but selling a mission or, or an idea that this could be done differently um, and take it from there. Beautiful. Um, so again, Taylor, um, we want to thank you for having, for, for coming to the show. Um, very quite interesting what you guys are doing. And I think there's a whole like little revolution being sparked up behind the scenes. Um, and just to give a shout out to some places where people can find um, your bottled water uh, in Texas, at least. Um, can you name drop a couple places where they could find you guys just so... Sure. So we're at we're at um, all of the bunkhouse properties. So St. Cecilia, San Jose, uh, you know, most of the McGuire Mormon restaurants. Mm -hmm. um, we are at the Line Hotel, the Four Seasons in Houston and Dallas. We are at the Ritz in Dallas. We're uh, at Cosmic Coffee. We're at, um, I, let me think. They can I, order online. Yeah. You can order it online. Please, yeah. uh, please come. Right now we're running, um, we're running a partnership with the Nobility Project and Well Aware um, so that as much as 40% of your order will go towards um, a very specific clean water project in Africa that, uh, that we're partnering with Nobility Project and Well Aware on to um, fund here sometime in the next month or two. Yeah. So uh, if you're in Austin, please go to the website and, yeah. and buy water directly from us <laughs> so that we can um, make sure that project gets funded and, you know, you can... Drink water to give water, I think, yeah. is the tagline that we've come up with. That's beautiful. Yeah. And um, I guess we're going to have to have you on here another time because I would love to talk about um, how you guys help during the water crisis in Austin. And I know you guys also have a pretty cool uh, subscription deal for when it comes to water. But we're going to have to end this for today and just have you on some other time. Great. Thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. <laughs>